So when I looked at who else would be speaking this evening, I realized that there was a focus on each of the three points of evidence-based practice, or EBP, which the American Speech Language Hearing Association has represented as a triangle. Researchers focused on finding and sharing evidence of treatment efficacy, a parent who is also a state leader in autism advocacy, and myself, a clinician focused on treatment and teaching future professionals in the field. The relationships between us matter in implementation of evidence-based practice, but also in a larger way. Relationships, partnerships, information sharing, and dissemination across disciplines, from research to practice, and from practice to advocacy, are all necessary to move us forward. So my side of this triangle is clinical experience. I asked myself, what can I share about autism that's meaningful to a broad audience? I decided to talk about skills for social interaction and social communication, as this is what I most often work on in the clinic. Why? Because there's research suggesting that social communication skills in children are related to outcomes. Because these skills are often important to families. Because these skills are diagnostically significant. To have an autism diagnosis, you have challenges with social skills and relatedly with relationships. And because these skills impact a person across all environments and across the lifespan. Recently, the New York Times published an article by Claire Kane Miller, Why What You Learned in Preschool is Crucial at Work. It highlights the importance of social skills in the current and future job market, and this article had no mention of autism. I am guessing that all of us in this room can think of a person they know who is highly skilled at interacting with others. This person never forgets a name, makes you feel comfortable, maybe even important, and transitions in and out of any situation with ease. You can imagine that this person is able to facilitate connections between people and to lead others. I am also guessing that all of us in this room can think of a person they know who isn't very skilled socially. This person may be consistently late, monopolize the conversation, or be difficult to end a phone conversation with. What happens for this person? I'm not suggesting that this person has autism, just highlighting my next thought. When I think about social skills, I visualize many of them on a continuum. Let's talk about eye contact, for example. There's a range of eye contact with which people feel the most comfortable. There are individuals that make a little eye contact and those that make significantly more. What happens, though, on either end of the continuum? How do you feel when someone is staring at you? How do you feel when somebody doesn't look at all? For many social skills, I conceptualize this continuum. There's a range of skills for, with which a communication partner feels comfortable. Michelle Garcia Winner, founder and CEO of Social Thinking, has explained our skills for social interaction in ways that help to teach social cognition for those who have social challenges. For example, she teaches us that we have thoughts and feelings about those who are around us. People are generally most comfortable with expected behavior behaviors that we can understand. It is often unexpected behavior that leads to discomfort and misunderstanding. Examples of unexpected behavior may be standing close during a conversation or yelling in response to a mistake. I can remember a conversation between two five-year-old boys who were diagnosed on the autism spectrum, each very different. I've changed their names um, for confidentiality. Jacob and Sam, or Jacob asked Sam about his vacation to the beach. Sam then responded by telling Jacob something like this. We took 465 around the city, and then we went on 865 until we went through the tunnel. Then we took 65 to the bridge. We stopped for lunch at 6543 Parkway. Then we kept driving and we saw license plates with numbers. At the hotel, we stayed in room 314. We got to take the elevator and we had to press number three. At this point, Jacob was slumped down in his seat with his head on his hand, sighing loudly. Sam didn't notice because he was not consistently looking toward Jacob. Additionally, he wasn't reading his body language. This became a teachable moment and highlights the difference between each child. Jacob was attempting to use his body language to communicate, but Sam wasn't, wasn't looking to see it. 
Sam also didn't understand that Jacob didn't share his interest in the route to vacation. He was more interested in the activities of the trip itself, such as swimming in the ocean. What then makes all of this even more challenging is that social expectations and interactions change across the lifespan, environments, communication partners, and values and culture. The expectations for how a four-year-old interacts with friends is very different than how a 40-year-old interacts. As a child, how we interact with a friend should be different than how we interact with the school principal. The yelling that's done at a football game would not be accepted in the library. Although there is a sense of rules, they are constantly changing. One of the first adults I met with an ASD was a college student who came to my workplace as a volunteer. When he started, he indicated he was very interested in autism, and he had started an autism club on his campus. The club was designed to bring people together to talk about autism, rather than being a club for people with autism. Bill, I've again changed the name, was highly intelligent, motivated, and information seeking. When volunteering in a classroom with preschoolers with autism, he played with the sensory toys, engaged minimally with the children, and needed a lot of direction. In most interactions, he was loud and a little bit awkward. After some time volunteering, um, he revealed to me that Asperger's, a diagnosis on the spectrum, had been mentioned to him in high school. A year or so later, Bill spoke at a conference that I attended about his path to diagnosis, which happened after I was no longer working there. I remember two things from his talk. For him, it was easier to speak to a large group than within one-on-one -on -one conversations because of the nuances that are included in one-on-one -on -one conversations. The second, he had a friend in college that helped him with his social skills. He compared this friend to a seeing eye dog for a person who is blind. I don't remember the exact term he used, but this friend gave him ideas and feedback about things that Bill did that worked and that did not work as related to his interactions with others. Bill was appreciative for the insight his friend shared with him and the way that he did it. Bill went on to medical school. When you have difficulty understanding that another person has different thoughts and feelings than you do, it can be hard to build friendships. There's a clip from the TV show The Big Bang Theory in which Sheldon is trying to make new friends. It's called the friendship algorithm. He takes a children's book about friendship and draws a diagram of how Stu the cockatoo made friends at the zoo. He then attempts to call a potential new friend to try it out, but he gets stuck in a loop. His friends help him to get out. But what can we learn from this? Does it work to have a diagram about relationships? As a clinician, it's my job to figure this out. I'm hoping that I've given you ways to consider social skills and the sense of relevance to our daily life. I learn more about social communication from every person with whom I work. And here is more of what I've learned from my clinical experience from my side of this evidence-based practice triangle. Look to the research to guide treatment. We've already talked about that being another side of the triangle. It is important to know that what we are doing in the clinic works or does not work. We need to know who the methods work for and also who they don't work for. Then always think critically and evaluate the evidence you have gathered for an individual person. If the literature says it works, but progress isn't being made, a clinical decision has to be made. I have been fortunate in my career to have worked in places where evidence-based practice is a priority. I've been able to see how implementing research-based practice is important in treatment efficacy. Listen. Listen to the individual and his or her family, which is another side of the, the triangle. Be responsive and build relationships. Work with individuals and families to understand what's important and build rapport. Individualize your treatment. Every person with autism has a unique set of strengths and challenges. Everyone is different. I have met people with amazing abilities as well as significant challenges. Focus on abilities and continue to build from there. Never underestimate. Don't set limits. There was once a young man who came in for an evaluation that started saying words at the age of 18. Incorporate motivation. We all work harder when we like what we are doing when it's meaningful to us, and in some cases, when there's a reward. Teach the reasons for skills, but also practice them in ways that are real. Knowledge of a skill is not enough. Application is necessary. 
provide opportunities for success. Have an understanding of autism, but always be open to new learning. You can learn from every new individual you meet. Incorporate visual supports and provide means of communication. Words are fleeting, visuals are static. Maintain a lifespan perspective. Consider what is important now, but also what will be important later. Social communication isn't always easy to teach, but skills can improve with practice. Additionally, we can learn from Sheldon and Bill, who both have the support of friends who are co-pilots in navigating the social world when they want help. My part is just one point of the EBP triangle. My clinical experience has been influenced both by research and by individuals and families affected by autism. We need all the parts. We need to work together. In these days of increasing numbers of individuals diagnosed with ASD and increasing number of children becoming adults with ASD, it is likely that everyone will know or interact with a person with autism. Continuing to work together to advance our knowledge of autism, to advocate for individuals and families, to increase awareness and acceptance, and to implement treatment to promote positive life outcomes is critical. Thank you.